There you go. Okay, tonight we're going to talk about the hind little yoth. And that's an interesting, interesting lay. And I want to point out something too, because there, it's, it's included in the Poetic Edda, the Bellows translation, the poem Heindla, but it, it, is, um, it is not in the great manuscripts of the Poetic Edda, but it is included in the Book of the Flat Island, the Flatter Yarbach. It's an enormous compilation made somewhere about 1400. The lateness of the manuscript would of itself be enough to cast doubt upon the condition in which the poem has been preserved. So it's from, you know, the, the, the 13th century, 14th century, somewhere in there. So it's literally 400 years after the original Codex Regius was put into place. But that tells you that in that time, there's still a cultivation. It's not a cut and dried line. Okay, for, at this point, they all stopped and became Christians. Well, no, that this mindset continued to, it continued to move forward and, and kind of boil around in the countryside. It continued to be thought of. It continued to be respected. And you can tell how much it's respected and what these people expected from it um, 400 years into the conversion. And I think, so this is one of the reasons I like it, but there's also some other really good stuff in here. It also contains a, um, it, right in the middle of it, there's 51 lines known as the short Voluspa. But this is not the short Voluspa that Snorri talks of. It's from somewhere else. And it was probably put together by two guys that said, well, let's put this in here, we'll put this in here. So it tells me that they weren't really aware of what they were writing. They were just copying shit. There was no, hey, what are you doing, man? <laughs> That's my son. I'm, anyway, so there's some history in there, but, there's an, but it provides an interesting snapshot of the transition from paganism into Christianity. <laughs> And it starts with all things with a woman, with a goddess, with this divine feminine. And if you look through the last videos, we talked about the complementing competing force of the divine feminine uniting with the divine masculine and this great storehouse of wisdom opening up the ability to understand things in the past and the promises that are made to support and protect each other at um, when Sigurd frees Brunhild. It's one of the, it's a real beautiful thing to me a man that has slain his dragon, has the courage to cross through the fire and free this woman from the prison she's placed around her own heart so the beauty of who she is might be expressed to the world. That's a real challenge on both parties. In return, she offers him this great wisdom from, from a previous time because she's ancient. And he makes a commitment to her. Uh, as soon as they come down off of that, they get fucked over and they both get killed and it sucks because the world eats their lunch. But the premise of it is what we got to be looking at. But now we come to Heindlioth. Freya spake, Maiden awake, wake thee, my friend, my sister Heindla, in the hollow cave. Already comes darkness, and ride we must to Valhall to seek the sacred hall. So in that first stanza, we have Freya um, reaching out to her, she calls her sister, literally sister, Heindla. Heindla means she-dog. So basically a bitch. So this goddess of divine feminine attributes calls her a friend and a sister and reaches out to this woman, this, this feminine being probably under a hollow cave. She may not necessarily be the highbrow cultivated kind of person that might reside in Asgard. She might be the woman that is still suffering. She might be the woman that is, <laughs> doesn't think very much of herself. She might be the woman who understands how the world works on the streets. And yet this goddess still calls her friend and sister. And it's a hollow cave. There's nothing beautiful in that cave. So there's a real interesting thing that comes there. She says, she, come on out. Let's go seek the hall. <laughs> the favor of here, Father, seek we to find. To his followers, gold he gladly gives. So 400 years into this conversion, they're still talking about Freya, this goddess, reaching out to the downtrodden person, the base element of a feminine divine, <laughs> and she's pointing out that the here father, Odin himself, to his followers, he gives gold gladly. So there's still a benefit to following these old ways that's not being smothered or butchered out of existence by this forced conversion of Christianity. To her moth gave he helm and mail coat. When Hermod went to visit with hell to reclaim Balder to bring him back to the world, he gave him helm and a mail coat. 
And to Sigmund, he gave a sword as a gift. Sigmund is Sigurd's father. So they kind of tie together. That sword was broken. Sigurd remakes it. Sigurd goes and slays his own dragon and handles his father's business. Now, the notes are the most interesting thing. <coughs> well, I digress. In those two stanzas, when we're looking at this and we're reading this, we had to figure out what good does that do me to understand any of that in today's world? The first thing is we need to be looking at these other people, these other people that are showing up here at these doors to this faith. They're not coming here because everything's going hunky-dory. They're coming here because something's hurt, something's broken, something's wrong, something is amiss somewhere in their being. And yet this goddess still calls this woman that's been through all of this shit, calls her sister and friend. And I think when people show up in also true, that's the kind of thing we need to be showing them. Come here, sister and friend. Come here, brother. And people always want to, you don't call me brother. I don't know you, blah, blah. Oh, shut the fuck up. You know, let's show them something worth that they've come home. That's always been kind of the keystone thing. And we have it right here in a stanza that shows that 400 years after the conversion, people are still welcoming. People are still demonstrating hospitality and generosity and asking people, come along this way with me. That's the first stanza of this poem. In the second one, we get this reminder that the following of these old ways is not some form of sacrifice or burden to bear, that there are rewards to living this also true life, that there are benefits to being one of these true to the Aesir, one of these faithful to the old ways. Now, we may not get a sword. We may not get a helm and a mail coat, but we will most assuredly be able to develop ourselves into someone that can focus to achieve his goals. And if that requires him to develop his body where he can, might need a helm and a mail coat, he can do so. Um, if he needs a sword, he'll know how to use it. His body will be physically developed. His emotions will be mentally stable enough. There's a promise there. And that is such a bold thing to say for people that still have a knee-jerk reaction against Christianity. But when people show up in also true, what are we offering them? And I have a stanza right here that says, I can offer you a future that's probably more than you can imagine. But we haven't figured that out yet. That's the whole kind of reason we're doing this because I see it again and again and again in all of these lays. There is a wonderful future for each of us to have. <laughs> so Freya reminds this bitch, which basically what it means, that these gods still reward the faithful. The um, triumph to some and treasure to others. There's another, there's the rest of the promises. Too many wisdom and skill in words. Fair winds to the sailor and to the singer his art and a manly heart to many a hero. These are the kind of things that allow us to navigate the world. Fair winds to the sailor is our clue. The singer, to have his art, to be able to sing, to touch the heart of someone else with, some, with those kind of words and phrases and vocabulary that inspire us to think of something better for ourselves or to reminisce about someone we've loved or lost. And then we remember the triumph we have by surviving whatever we've been through, the treasure we have in the family and friends around us, or the little, literal treasure we've been able to accumulate by developing that focus, wisdom and skill in words. And that's such an important thing when you go in front of the thing. One of the great benefits of one of the, one of the blessings that, Sig that Brunhild gave to Sigurd was the ability to have wisdom and skill in words when he went in front of the thing so as not to most grievously agitate his opponent. If you're going to present a case in defense of yourself, you've got to be able to do it with words that make sense, that inspire, that prove right from wrong. Not to go in there and conquer with hateful, negative nonsense, but to go in there with a the kind of positive thing that presents you in the best light. That manly heart to many a hero in in many cases, every hero is afraid. Every person is afraid of something. Every person knows fear. Every woman has been afraid. Every man has been afraid at some point in their life. But that manly heart is the heart that knows how to operate in spite of that fear. Thor shall I honor and this shall I ask, that his favor true mayest thou ever find, though little the brides of giants he loves. 
that's a real that's a real transition point here. Thor is the warder of men, that Freya should honor him and ask that his favor true mayest this woman who is down on her luck ever find. He may not like the Bride of Giants, but I'll entreat on your behalf that you may ever find his favor. What a wonderful thing to ask for someone that you hardly know that's suffering, that's in a bad place, that you might ask the warder of men, this great defender of this realm, that you might ever find his favor. That's a beautiful, touching thing. And it's the kind of thing that we don't often see in also true. We don't see that expression of giving a damn about someone else. It's always the very macho man, but it's the strongest man that can give you a hand up. And that right there is what's happening. Here's the strongest of gods offering you a hand up. From the stall, now one of thy wolves lead forth and along with my boar shalt thou let him run. So bring on one of your wolves. Here's my boar. Let's let him run. For slow my boar goes on the road of the gods, and I would not weary my worthy steed. So this boar that she got dragging his ass, right? He's a fallout. So everybody's marching along towards that one door that all roads lead to Rome, all roads lead to the afterlife. We're all going to walk through that door. We we're all going to face the sun facing goddess. And some people are dragging their feet. Some people are have uh, pictured obstacles in their minds, to, uh, trouble after trouble, things of their own creation, difficulties that they focus on. They become great knots in the circulation in the tree of life. Freya has a solution for that. She says, bring one of your wolves out here. I'm going to give you forever. I'm going to bring you up, but let's play with the wolves. My boar's not moving fast. She cuts a wolf loose on his ass. That boar's going to pick up the pace when the wolf gets on his heels. Isn't he? He's going to start moving forward. And that's kind of the way it is with a lot of us when we come in here. Something brought us here. Uh, something, some people just had the presence of mind to realize there's got to be something better. But even at that, once we get in here and we find ourselves somewhat kind of comfortable, are we living up to our full potential? Are we living up to what we can do? I thought about it today. I'm doing a lot of things right now. I have to ask myself, are these things moving me towards the goals that I want to achieve? Are these, I heard Denzel Washington say it this morning. He said, you could spend a lot of time running in place and not go anywhere. Freya's solution is, is that challenge behind you is probably going to be much more difficult to contend with than what you're dragging your ass because you don't want to face it yet. She's not going to weary her worthy steed. Freya is going to move forward on her steed as she so chooses. She is a goddess. She's not going to spend all her time pushing and prodding and poking. She's going to throw something in there that's going to make you move forward. And that's exactly what happens here. But Heinle, being that she is, for lack of a better term, someone from the streets, uh, she sees through it and uh, she calls her on it. Heinle spake, falsely thou askest Freya to go, for so in the glance of thine eyes I see on the way of the slain thy lover goes with thee, Otter the Young, the son of Instein. <laughs> the small-minded individual will only ever see what they would be doing in those situations. The small-minded individual who is wrapped up in their own ego so badly that it has brought them to living under a rock will only ever see the best scenario they might make happen. They're always working a hustle. You know how hard it is to get someone who's strung out on drugs that's been living a life working a hustle or in some kind of pain to stop and say, well, maybe there is some good in the world. Heindler can't see that. So she immediately accuses this goddess that's offered her a helping hand with an accusation. The uh, Freya spake, wild dreams methinks are thine when thou sayest, my lover is with me on the way of the slain. There shines the boar with bristles of gold. Indils Vini, he who has made by Dane and Navi the cunning dwarves. So she points out, that's my steed over there. This isn't, uh, this isn't my lover. Now let us down from our saddles leap and talk of the race of the heroes twain, the God, the men who were born of the gods above. So this lady knows a lot. So she's cut a wolf loose on his ass, on Otter. 
to get him to keep get moving forward in life, to get focused on moving forward and becoming something. Now she gets the simplest of beings to come out and kind of talk about some of this stuff. So it's a real stunning, it's a stunning realization when you're moving through life and you think everything's going well and all of a sudden there's a challenge behind you that you weren't, weren't aware of. And then all of a sudden this stupid old person over here that's been sitting in a rocking chair for 30 years kind of looks at you and giggles and you realize you're not quite doing as hot as you think you were. It's called eating humble pie. Well, she's fixing to give him a big dose of humble pie because she got the dumbest, meanest, ugliest thing she could find to remind him, look, you're made of some good stuff. But a wager she has made in the foreign medal, Audrey the Young and Angantyr. We must guard for the hero young to have his father's wealth, the fruits of his race. Okay. The, um, the foreign metal gold, the word valor meaning foreign and is akin to Welsh is interesting in this connection. And some editors interpret it frankly as Celtic. So right there we have this continued. Um, now we see the broadening of the horizons to not only this one little place, but now all of a sudden there's other regions involved. So in this great transition from paganism to Christianity, it was more than just one tribe dealing with this. So this belief system kind of was still very prevalent in more than one culture. The, um, so she's made this bet between Otter and Angantyr for a sh and his father's wealth and the fruits of his race. Now, if you remember the Riggs Thule, when we get to the third generation, or that ninth generation, we have Cone the Younger learns the language of the birds. He learns the use of the runes. He teaches them to his father, Jan, uh, Cone, or uh, Jarl Rig. Heimdall steps from the forest and calls Jarl one of his own. Okay? Cone is kind of wandering around lost, still fucking with the birds, still shooting at birds, wasting time, wandering around like a prince who doesn't have a care in the world. So the birds remind him, say, look here, buddy. You've got all of this knowledge. You need to go out and do something. Then he goes out and builds a kingdom for himself, and he establishes the race of the Danes. That is Cone Rig's legacy, right? He becomes his name Rig himself because he goes forth and establishes his own race. We have the same kind of situation going on here. We have a young man who's not really sure where he's supposed to be going, but he's got fooled around and got suckered into a bet with Angantyr. <laughs> He's too young to have his father's wealth or the fruits of his race. And one of the things Rig tells Jarl in the Rig Thule is, remember your heritage. The entirety of the Rig Thule is talking about their heritage, where you come from, this first generation, this second generation, this third generation, so on and so forth. From cavemen living on the floor in a, in a mud hut with a fire in the floor to somebody that has a house, to somebody that has the fine home, to those that become kings. So Otter's in this same boat that Cone is, and he has Freya to come help him. So we have this repeated idea that these gods will come down and help that individual that's on the right path, that there is benefit to living this also true life, that there is something greater to have. These gods will are showing us right there. I've heard too many times people say the gods don't give a shit about us, blah, 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 we're all on our own. But I've got all these lays here, all of these stanzas, all these beautiful ancient poems that say, Hey, these gods were involved in the affairs of men. Now, all of a sudden, here we are, 1,600 years later, all of a sudden, these gods are once again involved in the affairs of men. All of a sudden, we're beginning to look up and around and say, hey, wait a minute, there's something else over here. I'm going to go follow it. None of us are following this because we bought into the idea that there's going to be treasure and glory and all that stuff for us. We're following this because our hearts are pulling in this, in this direction. Imagine the strength of faith of a Christian if he were to move forward and not think that somebody had died for his sin. So I would submit to you based on that analogy that our faith is something much more powerful than anything they might ever espouse. Because no one is pointing out that there's proof of the success of this way of life. There's no example walking around in front of everyone saying, hey, I have this treasure. My good buddy Thor over here laid this out here. I've got the protection. I've got this. I've got that. But we do have a heritage. 
and we are creating something worth having. And she writes here how he got this divine assistance. For me, a shrine of stones he made, and now to glass the rock has grown. It takes a lot of heat to melt that silica and make glass. Oft with the blood of beasts was it red, and the goddesses ever did alter trust. And we have to remember that in Sigurd and Brunhild, it is Brunhild that opens up the door. The lay of the victory bringer, the treasure seeker, achieves his greatest victory when he learns that ancient wisdom of the divine, when he learns the use of the runes. So here, that was a person-to-person -person kind of culmination of a relationship, the foundations of which were also laid out in the Rig Thula. In this instant here, we're talking about man to divine. We're talking about how us regular individuals might interact with the divine and what we might expect from it, how we got it, with dedication. The faith of our ability to believe in these gods and goddesses was ever at the forefront of his mind because he always kept a fire burning. Be it literal or mentally, there is a fire burning that keeps them ever at the forefront of our mind. The nine noble virtues help us do that best. So far, that's what we've come up with. Off with the blood of beasts was it red. Sacrifices were made. Ideas, <laughs> for us, maybe not so necessarily much animals, though I do know some people that have engaged in such. But for us, it needs to take more along the lines of Odin, sacrificing those parts of himself that made him unworthy to rule Asgard. That's where... I always say a goddess cut him off that tree and he learned, he, he heard the songs of his ancestors where Otter must learn the fruits of his race and his father's wealth. And he picked up the runes. For us, the blood of beasts ever to that altar stone must be read is that we've got to divest ourselves of those ideas, attitudes, things that we've been taught make us important and get rid of them and allow us to become something more to sacrifice those aspects of our ego that keep us from opening our eyes to see what we're really doing here. Because all of these lays are telling me we're doing something truly amazing here. Tell me now the ancient names and the races of all that were born of old. Who are the Skuldjungs? Who are the Skilfings? Who are the Othlings? Who are, who of the Yilfings? Who are the freeborn, who are the highborn, the noblest of men that in Midgarth dwell? So even this, even Heindla understands what this is. But these, uh, I'll tell you who they are. The Skjöldung are the descendants of Skjöld, a mythical king who was Odin's son and the ancestor of the Danish kings. That's from Snorri's Edda and the Skald's Carmel. The Skilfings, mentioned by Snorri as defendants of King Skelfir, a mythical ruler in the east, in the Grimnismal, stanza 54. The Skilfing appears as one of Odin's many appellations. Othlings, Snorri derives the race from the Althi, the son of Halfdan the Old. Hifling, some editors have changed this to Yinglings, as in stanza 16, referring to the defendants of Ying or Yngwe, another son of Halfdan. But the reference may hold to the same mythical family to which Helgi Hundingsbane belonged. So there's some there's some history and some legend and some myth all tied in there, but they all seem to serve an important part. That inspiration of who we might be are may not always necessarily be something written in black and white. That inspiration to the greatness of who we are may be that thing calling in our hearts to say there's something better, I believe in it, and with a laser-like focus, I'm going to go get it. Heindla spake, thou art Otter, the son of Einstein, and Einstein, the son of Alf the Old. Alf of Ulf, Ulf of Sifari, and Sifari's father was Von the Red. Pretty powerful heritage right there. Thy mother, bright with bracelets fair, height, methinks, the priestess Hledis. Frothy her father, and free out her mother. Her race of the mightiest men must seem. So we have the powerful man, the hero who's accomplished great things, and the second one is the mother, bright with bracelets fair. So we have a cultured woman who has the, the money to afford a bracelet as a priestess. So once again, we have the same reiteration of what you find in the, in the lay of the victory bringer. You have the hero who has slain his dragon and crossed through the fire. 
and you have the divine feminine that offers him that inspiration, right? When she's free to express the beauty of who she is. Few things can express beauty of who they are like a priestess. <laughs> so those two right there, that's a reiteration of the same pattern we see throughout the Rig Stula and throughout the lay of, uh, of Sigurd. Of old, the noblest of all was Ali, before him half dead, foremost of skilled dogs. Famed were the battles the hero fought, to the corners of heavens his deeds were carried. He built a kingdom for himself out of his own hand. And we're still looking at the magnificent design of some of his fortresses in Denmark. The solstitial alignment, east and west, north and south, things we weren't supposed to know until the 18th century. All four corners of heaven are marked in his fortresses. Strengthened by Iman to the strongest of men, Sigtir he slew with ice cold sword. His bride was Almveg, the best of women, and 18 boys did Almveg bear him. Okay, the. Uh, hmm. These, of these 18 boys, this is, nine of them were slain, but the nine were traditionally the ancestors of the most famous ha families of Northern hero lore. So that's the foundation of the royal houses of Europe and some of Russia. Hence come the Skildungs, hence come the Skilfings, hence the Othlings, hence the Englings, hence come the Freeborn, hence the Highborn, the noblest of men that in Mid Mythgard dwell. All of thy kinsmen, otter thou fool. So she tells him right there that his ancestors understood the foundations of ceremony that occur in the Rig Stula when the son is presented a wife who's brought to him on a carriage and they sit and talk at the bedside before they take the wedding bed. When Sigurd sits and talks with Brunhild and begins to understand the language of the runes and the language of the birds, all that stuff. This has also happened in his line. And it's also happened in our line. The fact that we don't remember our heritage, the fact that we don't remember our history, because as Graham Hancock says, we are a species with amnesia, we're fools. We have sacrificed our ability to become great for comfort. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I enjoy my air conditioning. I'm probably not going to give it up. I will buy solar panels and keep that sunbitch running. You watch. But Otter's dragging his feet on this path of life. So she cuts a wolf loose on him. She's got this simpleton telling him, reminding him of who he is. And it continues on. Hildegund then her mother Height, the daughter of Savava and Seo Kanong, and all are thy kinsmen, art thou fool. It is much to know. Wilt thou hear yet more? So she reminds him, here's some other great people who are your part of your heritage, part of your race. The mate of Dag was a mother of heroes, Thora, who bore him the bravest of fighters, Frathmar and Girth, and the Frekis twain, Arm of Jofnir and Alf the Old, it is much to know, wilt thou hear more? Her husband was Kettle, the hero of Clype. He was of thy mother and the mother's father. Before the days of Kari was Frothi, and the horn of Hild was Lothin. Next was Nana, daughter of Nokvi, the father's kinsman, her son became old as the line and longer still and all of thy kinsmen, honor thou fool. Nana, Nana is Baldur's wife. So right there, she's reminding him there's a direct lineage to the divine as it's been incorporated into this race again and again and again. And she calls him a fool for not remembering this. Aesol, Aesolf and Olsolf, the sons of Olmoth, whose wife is Skurhild, the daughter of Skekil, Count them among the heroes mighty, and all of thy kinsmen, honor thou fool. Gunnar the bulwark, Grim the hardy, Thorir the iron shield, Ulf the gaper, Rod and Horvid, both did I know, in the household they were of Hrolf the old. King Hrolf, Gautric's son of Gautland, the saga relating to whom uh, appears, um, it's the Fornalder saga, three, page 57. Hervoth and Hjorvroth, Hrani and Angantyr, Buin and Brahmi, Beri and Refnir, Tind and Tyrfing, the Haddings Twain, and all are thy kinsmen, all are thou fool. Eastward and Bohm were born of old, the sons of Arngrim and Ifura, with berserk tumult and baleful deed, like fire over land of the sea they fared, and all are thy kinsmen. 
these are great explorers. These are people that have ventured out away from the safety of what they were raised to find new horizons. And not only that, but to conquer them and call them their own. The sons of Jormunrek, all of yore to the gods in death were his offerings given. He was the kinsman of Sigurd. Hear well what I say, the foe of hosts and Fafnir slayer. So right there she ties him into Sigurd. From Volson's seed was the hero sprung, and Jordish was born of Hrothong's race, and Ilmi from the Othlings came, and all are thy kinsmen, Otter thou fool. Again and again and again, all of these great houses of royalty, of nobility, of great warriors, she reminds him, you're a part of that. And I wonder sometimes if this, all of this hasn't been preserved for 1600 years to remind us that we're a part of that too. But it begs the question, we may be fools for forgetting it, which, what were we supposed to do? We grew up with the instruction of our parents. We grew up with the instructions of society, with the church, with the culture that had no need of such men. But if you look at the world today and how it's changing, it may be important for us to recognize that as these gods again become involved in the affairs of men, the strength of such men might be needed more than ever. Un the deep-minded was Ivar's daughter, but Rathbarth the father of Randvar was, and all of thy kinsmen, all of thou fool. Un the deep-minded, the great lady of the sagas, uh, the wonderful queen, fascinating individual. If you don't know much about her, I highly recommend you learn about her. She was uh, important. <laughs> but it breaks off here at stanza 29 for the fragment of the short Veluspa. And this talks about the death of Balder. Eleven in number the gods were known when Balder over the hill of death was bowed. And this to avenge was Valley Swift when his brother Slayer soon he slew. So the death of Balder, the loss of one of the heroes, one of the founding members of the great royal houses of Europe, the son of Odin, the very light of the world. And we have to recognize the fact that Balder was a solar deity. When he is carried over the hill of death, his brother was born. Valley is a powerful representation of the same kind of focus that Otter needs to be displaying, but he is not. Otter should be focused on moving himself forward down that path, not in a rush to get to that doorway to death, but to develop and become what he's supposed to become. Valley demonstrates to us, he is that example of the single-mindedness of purpose, laser-like focus. If you know any kind of successful individual at all, be it in faith, be it in money, be it in sports, be it in, in the military, be it in any kind of profession, the ones that always succeed are the ones who bear that single-mindedness of purpose. And in our case, it happens to be with regards to this faith. And Valley is that example. When we lose the light of the world, there is a son born that presents the single-mindedness of purpose to do nothing but avenge that death, to do nothing but find out how to fix it. And we're kind of in the same boat. And we're being reminded here that all of these people all of this was our heritage. This is what we all come from. These great kings, these conquerors, these men who were men by their own hand, and the great women who were part and parcel of their life, who supported them, complimented them, were respected in their own right. That great complimented competing force that made a whole that allowed, allowed our ancestors to create great civilization after great civilization and the direct influence of the gods on all of it. When the light of the world is stolen by the uninspired human intellect, one God shows up who has no other thing but the single-minded idea to avenge that death. And that's the boat we're in right now. The father of Balder was the heir of Burr. That's Odin. He inherited the, inherited the throne of Asgard. Freyr's wife was Gerth, the daughter of Gimir, the giant's brood. And our both abhor her. To these as well was Theazi kin, the dark living giant, his daughter Skadi. <laughs> Frey, Gerth, Gerder, and Theazi. Gerder and Theazi are two Jotuns that worked to justify their seat at the table. 
these great divine feminine beings, excuse me, did something to become a part and parcel of the divine in Asgard. The Ozzy, when he was slain, Scotty showed up and demanded shield from the Aesir. Frey sacrificed that great symbol of masculinity, the great warrior symbol of masculinity. He gave up that sword that was so great that it would fight of its own accord to become to set aside the soldier and become the lover in his home. So he's, he, he, you see this real growth pattern here. But the key thing to point out about all of that is that these were people that were willing to develop. These were people that were willing to set aside some aspect of who they were to become something more. Pattern that needs to be repeated today with the same single-mindedness of purpose that Valley demonstrates. We have much to reclaim. Much have I told thee, and further will tell, that there is much to know. Wilt thou hear more? Hyth and Cross Thief. Now, this is where Cross Thief is the third all-powerful female Jotun that enters the golden age of Asgard. We know Golveg, the love of gold, or the lover of gold. Hyth, the bewitching one, the bewitching of men's minds by the ideas of gold and wealth. And Cross Thief, Horse Thief that very corruptive element that, that denigrates Awas, the teamwork, the rune of the horse. Men build civilizations with the teamwork they have with animals. When men begin to love gold and they become bewitched by the idea of it and they lose their ability to work with each other or as a team or with the great beasts of burden we have, <coughs> that's a frustrating state of mind, isn't it? That's a state of chaos and confusion. That's a state where people want all this greatness, but don't have the ability to work with something else to get it. They're bewitched by it. And in that bewitching, they lose their ability to work together. Those are the three all powerful females, Jotuns that enter Asgard's golden age and bring about its demise. The Sibyls from Vithalf's race, from Vilmeth, all the seers are, and the workers of charms are Zwarthrofi's children. These are the Dark Elves. And from Ymir sprang the Giants all. These are the forces that are working against us. And I spoke with Heather about it earlier. We have spent generations being told, don't look over there. It's like Robin Williams in Good Morning Vietnam talking about a protective dike. It's a woman in comfortable shoes saying, don't go near there. But that was the same kind of thing with us. We've had a church saying, don't look in the woods. Don't look over here. There's a devil over here. There's a demon over here. There's something people go missing in these woods. What if all that's real? Now all of a sudden we're completely defenseless against such things because we've believed that something else was going to take care of it for us. The courage of those men never failed. They believed that the gods were on their side, that the warder of men was there. They wore those iron crosses for a reason. Much have I told thee, and further will tell that there is much that I know. Wilt thou hear yet more? One that was born in the bygone days of the race of gods, and great was his might. Nine giant women at the world's edge once bore the man so mighty in arms. Gyalp, there bore him grief, there bore him Isla and Igriatha. Ulfran bore him and Anganya, Im and Outla and Jarn Saxa. These are the mothers of Heimdall. And the mother's, Heimdall's mother's names may be rendered be Yelper, Griper, Fomer, Sand Strewer, She-Wolf, Sorrow Whelmer, Dusk, Fury, and the Iron Sword. <coughs> Thor slays all of them. Thor ends up killing all of them as he, uh, Gyalp is the one that stands across the river and tries to flood Thor and he has to crawl out. Uh, that's one of the mothers of Heimdall. <coughs> that's a whole other story that Loki created this problem that Thor had to go settle, and he had to kill all of those giants, giant women, to get to this giant that had caused so much problem. Strong as he made with the strength of earth, with ice cold sea and the blood of swine. All kinds of things can be said of that. The strength of earth and the ice cold sea and the blood of swine. The blood of swine is the sacrifice. That is the bloat 
that is the offering to the gods, that is the holy connection of the divine, that is the fluid, that is the lagoos upon which those divine energies flow. The ice cold sea and the strength of the earth, those are unmitigated, unparalleled, world changing power. They can eliminate men in an instant. And this God had power over all of it. One that was born the best of all and strong he was made with the strength of the earth. The proudest is called the kinsman of men and of all the rulers throughout the world. This is Thor. Yord was his mother, the warder of men, <coughs> the best of all of us. Much of I told thee and further will tell. There is much that I know, wilt thou hear yet more. The wolf did Loki with anger both the wind, and Sleipnir bore he till Svartilfari. The worst of marvels seemed the one that sprang from the brother of Bailis to them. So that's the that's the wolf Fenrir. Okay, the eight legged horse. Um, but when you look at that, Loki had a wife, Sigyn, whose name literally means girlfriend. But he decides to go off into the woods and have this torrid affair because he thinks he can do it right. We see the same thing with people that come into the AFA of all things or Ossetra as a whole, and they take a look around and they get full of themselves because they got a hundred people out of seven billion that give a lot to what they're doing. <laughs> and they decide to go off somewhere else and try it on their own. And right here we have this example of the uninspired human intellect going off in the woods, trying to create something good of his own. And the only thing he does is create monsters the monsters that are responsible for the death of the world. A heart ate Loki in the embers it lay, and half-cooked found he the woman's heart, with child from the woman Loki soon was, and thence among men came the monsters all. Now that half-cooked heart has a lot to do with Sigurd, but there's no, there's no reference to it um, where it came from. But it is most likely... Um, the serpent. The sea storm driven seeks heaven itself. Over the earth it flows. The air grows sterile. Then follow the snows and the furious winds. For the gods are doomed and the end is death. Then comes another greater than all. Though never I dare speak his name. Few there are now that farther can see. That moment when Odin shall meet the wolf. So that's the short Veluspa. <coughs> Have all these gods. They make sacrifice to become who they are. Heimdall is... It is this wonderful, powerful, divine being that fathers mankind. Thor is this powerful being, both of whom are from the earth. Um, and they are the father of men and the warder of men. It's a real powerful, comforting thing there. But it's the uninspired in human intellect that goes off into the woods and creates those ideas that destroy mankind. And even as dangerous as they are, there's something even more storm, more worse. The sea storm seeks heaven itself. Over the earth it flows, the great tidal waves. This is the sons of Mim on the march. Then the fall of the snows and the furious winds, the fimble venter, um, the ice age. The gods are doomed and the end is near. Surely if you're living in an environment that changes, <laughs> because when we talk about the Younger Dryas impact, the theory that I put forth that it's recorded in the Voluspa, you have to remember that the Younger Dryas impact was not just a once and done thing. That event happens twice a year for something like 10 or 20 years. Every spring and every fall when we enter the torrid meteor shower, huge chunks of meteorites would fall down and create some kind of devastation somewhere in the world. Ice Age moved forward, things got colder, 35 genera vanished. It was a real terrible time. If these legends are indeed that old and talk about something much more ancient than we can understand, that written record of it, it might truly be a terrifying time. Now man himself in his uninspired human intellect has the capability to do the same thing without any kind of divine intervention, without any kind of a sunspot or solar flare or earthquake or comet. If India and Pakistan set off a tactical nuke, two of them, it will change the weather around the world. We have diseases and plagues that wash across mankind. We've had two 
wars, political movements and ideologies that killed north of 100 million people in the last century. Our uninspired human intellect has gone off in the woods and bred things that will destroy us with that before we even know it. Now the gods are again involved in the affairs of men as now this is resurfaced to help us make it through that time. It's unavoidable, it will happen. Maybe not a nuclear bomb, but a comet will. A tidal wave will, ask those people in Thailand. <coughs> Freya spake, to my boar now that bring the memory beer, so that all thy words that well thou hast spoken, the third morn hence he may hold in mind when the races otter and angantyr tell. So there it is repeated again, where this divine feminine offers a man who is on a journey, who's trying to do better, who's moving down this path of life, she offers him a memory drop so he might remember all of it. <clears throat> and that's an important thing to do. It is always the love of a woman that inspires men to do the greatest things. The works of art, the great wars, the just about anything. Those achievements to create that environment come from love. A reminder that there's something worth defending. And I didn't even realize that until I had a little girl. And then it's all bet you're off, buddy. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> but Freya gives this to them. This divine feminine once again gives him this memory here. Hindless spake, hence, thou shalt, hence shalt thou fare, for fain would I sleep. From me now thou gettest few favors good. My noble one out in the night thou leapest, as Hythrin goes, the goats among. So her wolf has run off. He's been distracted. He's going to go kill some goats. She's done wasting her time on these fools. She's wore out. She's going to get some wrath. To oath didst, didst thou run whoever thee loved. Now that's oath, Oda, her, her original lover, the one that's wandered off and left her with two daughters whose names literally mean treasure. It's Freya. <laughs> and many under thy apron have crawled. My noble one out in the night thou leapest, as Hythrin goes the goats among. So Hindler leaves Freya with this little bit of insult. <clears throat> and once again, it's an individual that cannot understand the interaction of the divine. Who is to say what it might look like if a divine goddess were to touch a man, were to share inspiration with him? For the small-minded individual, it's going to be something so shallow as many under thy apron have crawled. Freya break, around the giantess flames shall I raise, so that forth unburned thou mayst not fare. So that's the final insult. Flames I see burning, the earth is on fire, and each for his life the price must lose. Bring then to otter the draught of beer, a venom full for an evil fate. Freya spake, thine evil words shall work no ill. Though giantess bitter thy baleful threats, a drink full fair shall otter find if all of the gods the favor I get. <coughs> so when it comes time to really deliver, Hindless starts crawfishing. She should throw a little insult. And Freya has to give her this gentle reminder. Look here, I will burn your ass, woman. You know, I don't know who you think you're fooling with, but you're not going to get out of here with that kind of nonsense. So she produces the drink. She gives otter the draught of beer and once again, this divine protection shows up. These evil words are not going to have any effect on him. A drink full fair shall otter find. It is that drink of that divinely inspired liquid, that mead, that Lagu's connection one more time, that the ability of divine energy to flow through the world resides squarely within the realm of the liquid. Everything that lives, moves, breathes, crawls, sleeps, talks, whatever, is composed largely of water. The divine inspiration that falls upon our minds, which is an organ largely composed of water, is an impulse through fluid. And this divine, this draught of beer, this memory draught, there's a reason they call it a memory draught, so that we might remember. Anyway, that's my take on the uh, Heindel Yoth. And I hope you guys appreciated it. I know I enjoy talking about it. It's one of my favorite poems. There's a lot in that. And when I sit down to write it, <laughs> I'm trying to write, as I do these, I'm trying to write them in a book. And uh, you'd be surprised how much typing there is when you try to type somebody that's been talking, running his mouth for an hour. 
Uh, but at any rate, I appreciate your time tonight, guys. Thank you all. And uh, I hope you guys have an awesome day tomorrow. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a good time. We'll see you. Uh -huh.